So th this will be about uh, a talk about lower bounds. And this is joint work with Ankit Garg and Tenyu Ma, who are students at Princeton. Hui Nguyen, who is here, he's a TTI uh, now. And David Woodruff, who spoke yesterday. Uh, so the, the basic model is the same, except uh, so one change is that we'll be in the Blackboard model. So we have a data that's partitioned, most of the time partitioned. Uh, so essentially partitioned randomly. So we don't assume that it's distributed in some nasty way. And uh, the communication is in the Blackboard model or the broadcast model, which means that when one machine speaks, everyone uh, else gets the message. And this is. An easier model if you're in the business of algorithms and a harder model if you're in the business of lower bounds. Uh, and so the basic problem, we, I guess, could have called it machine learning, but essentially it's a statistical problem. So the, the, there is an unknown parameter theta, and uh, we get ID points from distribution d theta. Most of the time it will be a Gaussian. And the goal is to output an estimator based on the data. And the objectives are low communication and obviously minimizing loss. Okay, so that's, that's the basic setup. Uh, so, and f uh, for the most part, we'll talk about distributed uh, sparse dis Gaussian esti mean estimation, specifically sparse Gaussian mean estimation. So uh, we assume we get vectors who are. Uh, in I, who are independent Gaussians from the d-dimensional space, so the ambient dimension is d. We assume, and th this is a common assumption in learning, that sometimes it's supposed to make your models more, well, the sparsity makes, well, basically allows you to learn with less data or faster or make better predictions. So it's, it's some simplicity assumptions about the assumption about the data that we are making. So M machines, each machine gets N samples of this. So it's essentially the same as having the samples randomly partitioned because it doesn't matter whether you first produce the samples and then distribute them or just produce them independently. Uh, and there, there is standard deviation sigma. So there are a lot of parameters and uh, We'll try to get, I mean, I'll try to make it as simple as possible in terms of those. And the goal is to estimate the mean. That's it. OK, so just uh, to, to get used a little bit, since we have to spend the next 20 minutes with these parameters, let's try to get used to them a little bit. So just let's see if each of those, when it goes up, does it make estimation with a given error r? Uh, harder or easier? So if I increase the dimension, is, does my life become harder or easier? It's not a trick question. Oh, harder. OK, what about sparsity? Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a promise, so it's just a logical fact. What, an, what about the number of machines? So that's a trick one. Depends on the number of samples per machine. Well, without changing n. Hmm? No, it's it's the broadcast model. It's easier uh, or the same. Yes. Yeah, so exactly. So it's easier. Uh, it's but it's not strictly easier in the same sense as those guys because. Uh, yeah. So but but yeah, it's easier because you don't have to use all the machines. Number of samples per machine. Well, take n to infinity. Did your life become easier or hard? Easier. And standard deviation, that's if I increase it, there are just scales with standard deviation. So it's harder. OK, so here is the main result. And OK, so it's still it has to use the alphabet soup. But, uh, but we'll interpret it in a simple way in a second. So, the, so, so basically, this, this is the bound on. Uh, uh, on the error, let's parse it for a second. Uh, so, okay, so it's a maximum of two things. This thing goes down this C, 
But it obviously couldn't just be this. Why? C is the amount of communication. So I fix it's the, it's the amount of communication in the protocol. So if I bound my communication by C, I can keep, well, this term goes down, but it cannot go, the, the error cannot go all the way down to zero. Why? It's, it's yeah, yeah, so eventually this is the statistical. So this term is the statistical limit. So up to this point, the communication is the bottleneck, and then enough, uh, with enough communication, more communication is not useful. And it turns out that for optimal performance, so the, way to the easiest way to interpret this result is that you need communication of something like m times d. So the number of machines times the ambient dimension, which is pretty bad in some sense. So in specifically, it means that sparsity is not helpful. So if you make these two terms equal to each other, this is what you get. And this is tied up to some logarithmic factors. This is still an open uh, problem to, to, sh to, to nail this down. But to the first order, the message is that in this communication world, sparsity doesn't save you. And so it's a, uh, as Nina mentioned, it's, it's, this is a uh, very partial list of, uh, of prior works that are most relevant to this problem. So this paper that Nina referred to, uh, they did the case when uh, the d is equal to 1. Uh, for general communication and f the dense case where k is, is like d and, d and both are large for the simultaneous message model. Uh, and uh, uh, and the, de the, the dense case has previously been done uh, in a follow-up paper and also in a work by a subset of co-authors of this one. And there is a lot of recent interest uh, uh, in communication efficient distributed learning. This is, I would say, I'm not sure it's learning, it's distributed statistics, but. Uh, but this is the part of learning. Uh, but, uh, okay. Uh, uh, but yeah, so, so basically th those are the most re relevant works and this, this work up to logarithmic factors, it's a strict generalization and in the, it's, and it's the first tight result in the sparse case. Uh, okay, so now there are too many parameters. So now the, the, the point is, and, and this is how a lot of the time, a lot of the communication lower bounds work. The goal is to, to start re reducing the number of parameters. And uh, the first reduction is the, to the Gaussian mean detection problem. Uh, so it's a one dimensional problem. So we'll try to get rid of D. Uh, so we'll try to get, get get rid of the multiplicative d by, by arguing that, okay, you need to deal with, there are d dimensions, you have to deal with each one of them. So in the detection problem, the, you get samples from one of two distributions, either each machine gets a sample centered around zero or each machine gets a sample centered around delta. And each, each machine gets n sampled and the goal is to determine which is the case. Is it the shifted distribution on the, or the one centered around zero. Um, okay, so this is the goal and it turns out, so by a fairly standard by now direct sum argument, that if you can attain a too good to be true, if you can attain this uh, error uh, in the estimation problem, the one that, uh, that I mentioned before, then you can uh, apply, somehow embed uh, the detection problem into one of the coordinates and sell, solve the detection problem, unfortunately not in low communication, but in some notion of low information cost. <coughs> okay, and, uh, and it's a notion of mean information cost, which is slightly non-standard, but I'll, I'll get back to it. Uh, delta is this delta. So if you want to detect mu zero from mu one, if you want to distinguish between, if delta gets smaller, this problem gets harder. So to solve it, you need R to be smaller. 
okay, so now we are talking about uh, the detection problem. So, okay, so the right parameter uh, to prove this is, uh, okay, so this is what we need to rule out. So we need to rule out a sigma square over n delta square mean information cost detection solution. Okay, so, uh, so let's clean it up. So basically this is now what we need. Uh, so we want to distinguish between something centered around zero versus something centered around delta. And I also scaled everything by sigma, so there is no sigma. And we want this to be impossible using one over n times delta squared samples. And one more step is actually scale everything by n. So it's, it's a simple exercise to see that if you get n normal, n samples from the normal distribution, actually conditioned on their average, the rest is independent from the answer or from anything else. So you basically, you can summarize th those n samples as the average. So it's like getting one sample around either d uh, zero or delta with, with uh, variance of one over n instead of uh, one. And then we can rescale again. And here is the final task. We want to, each machine gets exactly one sample from one of these two distributions. And we want to show that it's impossible to distinguish between those uh, while, while communicating less than one over delta square information. Okay, so it's, now it's, we only have one letter. Uh, okay, and you can see that this, okay, I didn't tell you what's mean information cost, but you can see if this was communication, this makes sense, right? You need roughly one over delta squared samples to, to tell those two cases apart. Well, as long uh, for m large enough, if you just uh, have the first one over delta square machines and uh, publish their samples, or the signs of their samples and take the majority, and or or something. Uh, okay, so now we get to the technical meat, and uh, I won't obviously give any details, but uh, we'll get to discuss the main uh, the main idea. So. Uh, and the main kind of technical ingredient will be the strong data processing inequality about which uh, I'll talk in slightly more detail. So here, here we have our distribution mu v. So v is an unknown. It's either zero or one. This v, v based on this v, we select those samples x1 through xm and each machine gets one of these x's. Then they communicate using the blackboard and uh, so the, ba the most basic information cost of pi would be the mutual information between pi and the input. So if you, this formalism is not very essential for this talk. Basically, it, ca it asks how much information does the blackboard contain about the variables. And mean information cost is just the minimum of the amount of information that the blackboard contains in the two possible cases of v equals to zero or v equals to one. So it's a smaller quantity, so it's harder to lower bound, but essentially it's the same thing. So we also, we, we really only need one of them to be small, but for the purposes of how the results are stated, it doesn't matter, so might as well keep it this way. Uh, so we'll want this quantity, this mean information cost to be omega one over delta squared. Uh, it's not the same as conditional mutual information, but that's, that doesn't matter. Uh, and the fact that we need to use it is, is, is because of sparsity. But uh, again, so what would be, uh, so next I'll give you a quasi proof that doesn't work, but captures some of the idea of how you would want to prove something like this. So, what pi teaches us about x1, x2 through xm can be decomposed into terms of this form. Basically, what does pi teach us about the ith x? With some conditioning, but the standard tricks, you can kind of uh, swipe it under the rug. So, the basic, so basically, we can talk about what does pi teach us about each x separately. So if we look 
let's, let's examine what does it tell us about x1. So, so the sparsity was on how many coordinates have v equals to 1. So if you repeat this detection problem many times, on most coordinates the sparsity will be, uh, the, the v will be 0. So the prior is extremely biased towards v equals to 0. Uh, and because of, that's why you need this to be true even condition, uh, condition of v equals to 0. Because most coordinates, you know the answer, but you're not allowed to use it, to use this fact, because then you'll miss the ones where it's 1. Uh, but here's the basic intuition. So if we ignore the rest of the picture and only focus on one specific xi, this v xi pi form a Markov chain. Con conditioned, so whatever information pi contains about v, it has to come from the x's. And the intuition is this. So if, so xi contains very little information about v. xi is this noisy signal, very noisy signal generated from v, right? It's, it's this Gaussian that gets shifted a tiny, tiny bit if v is 1. So as it stands, xi contains very little information about v. If pi contains little information about xi, then it contains very, very little information about v. That's the intuition of the strong data processing inequality. So the standard data processing inequality just says that uh, pi cannot tell us about v more than it tells us uh, about xi, because everything it learns, I mean, if it was the only, uh, if, if, if xi was the, the only channel, we have n, ch we will eventually have m channels, but that's the basic idea. A strong data processing inequality says that there is a conversion factor beta here, and that we learn about v beta times less than what we learn about xi. So in order to get, say, one thousandth bit about v, we will have to get one tenth bit about xi. OK, so it turns out that, surprise, I mean, uh, that the conversion factor here is delta squared. So in order to get any amount of information about v, if you only know x, uh, through by communicating information about xi, you need to communicate 1 over delta squared information more about xi. And the extremal case, there are many extremal cases. He, here is one extremal case. So how much, mutual inf how much information does the sign of xi contain about v? Well, it's, it's basically how, uh, the best way to figure it out is to ask how many xi's do you need to figure out v? signs of x size do you need to figure out v? Roughly 1 over delta squared. So it means, means that the sign of each xi contains, so this quantity is delta squared, and this quantity is 1, right? Because xi determines its sign, and the entropy of the sign is, is, is 1, roughly. So this is delta squared. So the, this is the conversion factor. And so here is a proof. Um, so we, have the, we are now equipped with a strong data processing inequality. We managed to break this channel of b the information between pi and the x's into the mutual information between pi and each xi. And then we want to say that, OK, now uh, how much information pi conveys about v through player i is Delta uh, is delta squared times how much information does pi can convey about xi. This, this is the intuition. Okay, so in a perfect world where we could just take this intuition and convert it into formulas, that would be the proof because the, amount of, the total amount of information pi conveys about v should be a constant, should be like half a bit at least because we need to learn v in the end. And so, and, and the bound would just follow. So this is, of course, well, it's not even a mathematical statement. Uh, and it's actually, OK, so as ridiculous as it sounds, I think maybe one day we will be able to state those things in these terms, but not today. Uh, this is the right high level idea. There are two technical issues dealing with additivity over coordinates. I kind of pretended that you can just do it. And the second one is dealing with Mean, mean information, because this is a technical issue, so I'll keep ignoring it. 
So if the picture was like this, so only, so the difference between this picture and the previous one is that only x1 actually contains any useful signal. The rest are just fixed to be zeros. Then indeed it's actually this date strong data processing inequality is just true. So if, if the picture was like this, then, then the argument is solid. The problem is the picture is not like this. But you can decompose the, the original picture into this one using Hellinger distance. And this is the, uh, they're all mu v's. So and you want to say that the amount of information flowing in this picture plus this picture plus this picture and so on is equal to the amount of information in the original picture. This is not true, or we don't, not exactly true, but this is true if you are dealing with Hellinger distance. And that's how blackboard uh, majority was proven by JRAM. And we are using essentially the same, it's, it's essentially the same proof here. The problem is that instead of mutual information, you have to prove lower bounds on the Hellinger distance, which is slightly trickier, but uh, that's the other technical ingredient. And so finally, this is the technical uh, sorry, this is the technical theorem that puts puts it on together. Uh, it's all together. So it bounds the mean information cost in terms of the Hellinger distance, and the Hellinger distance we can lower bound. Uh, we can bound in terms of. Uh, so this, this Hellinger distance is a constant. Uh, because they have to output different things. So the only, con the only problem is, so beta is this, the strong data processing constant, which is 1 over delta squared, so that's great. The, pro the, the only problem is this condition. So remember what mu zero, uh, so, okay, so putting it all together, uh, we get, we get the, the results, so we are done, except, uh, I cheated again. So what is the problem with, with this condition? If mu zero and mu one are two shifted normal distributions. So the condition is that those two distributions, and it's actually necessary. You can show that otherwise this theorem fails. So the problem is you need those two distributions to be within a multiplicative constant of each other. So for two normals, it's always false actually. If you go far, far away, into, far, far enough into the tail, even a small difference of delta will amplify into any multiplicative difference. But luckily, uh, you can truncate and this doesn't happen until far enough so that it doesn't matter. So you can truncate mu zero and mu one to make it hold where it matters. Okay, so just to summarize, so we had the sparse Gaussian mean estimation problem. This is the, the problem I started with, with the uh, estimating a Gaussian mean of a bunch of samples where you're promised that most of those means are actually fixed to be zero. And using a direct sum argument, we, s we started talking about detection. So each, each input, each uh, machine gets a single sample and they need to detect whether those samples are centered around zero or around delta. And then using uh, strong data processing inequality, we get a one over delta squared lower bound. And the two ingredients that go into this is the Hellinger distance argument and the strong data processing inequality, which is kind of the, n the new thing in this context. Uh, also, so this is a problem that's kind of the reduction is not new. So I won't talk much about it, but the application the distributed sparse linear regression is an application that apparently people in ML care a lot about. So, uh, so basically, now each machine gets uh, uh, n data po points of the form. So they're trying to solve a regression problem. And uh, so each machine gets a noisy inner product of a or inner product with a parameter theta, so you, you can think about aj as the feature vector, uh, yj is the outcome, and we are trying to guess, uh, guess the weights. And we are promised, or we are trying to get a sparse regression, so we are promised that the theta is k-sparse, and the question is how much communication is needed. So now I won't uh, 
bore you with all the parameters because I, I have four minutes. So we'll just phrase the result in terms of achieving uh, near statistical optimal loss. So basically, I want to do as though everything was on one machine. And uh, it turns out that the answer is m times the minimum, is the, the best lower bound is m times the minimum between n and d. So again, small k doesn't help. That's the message of the result. So it means that, uh, that you would hope that it could be something like m times k or something like that, but it's not. And under some conditions, actually, there is an upper bound of m times d. So there is still some gap here, but, uh, but this seems close as well. So OK, so time is not permitting. I was going to talk about an upper bound. It's, it's a simple trick, but a simultaneous message upper bound for the detection problem. But we'll leave it as an exercise. Uh, so for the sparse linear regression problem, there is still a gap. That would be interesting to the, this minimum. So the, the dependence on n, it might be an artifact of the reduction. Uh, other statistical questions, even before we go into the broader ML context, even for pretty simple techniques, when can we just plug this uh, data processing argument as a black box? General theorems for that. Uh, and it's a question that has nothing to do with uh, distributed uh, uh, machine learning, but still, those techniques uh, keep. So there the question is, can these same techniques be used to prove uh, a, low, a linear lower bound for gap Hamming distance? We have, by now, like three different proofs for, for this problem. But it looks like this kind of technique should, should also yield this proof, and it would be illuminating. But the problem there is that in the distributed learning setting, there are m different machines that don't talk to each other. In the gap Hamming distance, the problem is very similar, except now each uh, the, the, uh, there are only two machines. So somehow, so far, the proofs haven't worked. And finally, let me uh, uh, give a plug for a program on information and computation uh, that's going to happen in Paris next uh, winter, so this coming winter. Uh, this is the website. That's, that's the main point of this slide. And there are topics. Some of uh, those present are actually involved in, in the organization or are going to participate. Uh, some of these topics are very relevant to those in the room. So please visit the website. There is uh, registration is still open. There even might be still some funding available. Uh, so if, if this is something you might find potentially interesting, please uh, go to the website. It's uh, in Paris, so, and this is the website. Thank you.